welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. It's really a pleasure to welcome back to Swift Hall's uh, Professor Nelson Tebby. Um, as you know, the program in the craft of teaching is designed to bring into Swift Hall some of our alumni and others who are every day doing major work in classrooms and in the public sphere vis-a-vis um, intelligent discussion of religion. Um, Professor Teddy holds a position that very few do, that is that um, he holds a JD from Yale Law School um, and he holds a PhD uh, in the Divinity School in the area of anthropology and sociology of religions, um, degree received with distinction in 2006. Um, I first got to know Nelson when uh, uh, his former professor, Martin Riedebrot, um retired, and Nelson came uh, for that celebration, and we just began talking, and every chance I get to talk to Nelson, I take, up, take it up. So I, I um, uh, saw him in New York City last April, and I'm always asking him, send me samples of what you're writing, because uh, he is working in an extremely creative, responsible, and important way at the interface of law and religion. And this is one of the places we need to be, I think, that, that we as scholars of religion really need to be um, in most conversations. Professor Teddy uh, holds the position of professor of law at the Brooklyn Law School in Brooklyn, New York. Um, among various publications, some that caught my eye, and at least one of which I uh, had the pleasure to read myself. Equal Access and the Right to Marry, um, Penn Law Review, 2010, Witchcraft and Statecraft, Liberal Democracy in Africa, Short Penn Law uh, Journal, 2007. Um, a symposium that I don't know about, I would like to know about, The Puzzle of Town of Greece versus Galloway in the Supreme Court of the United States, SCOTUS Law, um, in September of this year, 2015. Um, and Understanding La Isite in the Journal of Law and Religion, 2007 and 8. And then um, part of a larger, bigger project, I think, in which Professor Kennedy is engaged, Religion and Social Constitutionalism, and that was what we talked about in April, uh, right. and we met um, as well. Um, uh, I look forward to a really good conversation today to hear more both about your context um, and also about how you bring together your training as a research scholar um, in the field of religion and um, a scholar of law, and how your students also engage with these questions of religion and law that you try to work their way through. So everyone, please join me in welcoming Professor Nelson Tebby back to the Experience here is really singular, and I, I think there's not an intellectual climate uh, like this one anywhere in the world. Uh, and I hope you are cherishing your days here. Um, I'll back that up by uh, just a little anecdote. So I, I was at a conference in Geneva that was organized by Mark Riesbrook, who used to teach here, and um, there was a scholar that I was having lunch with who's Israeli, teaches at um, uh, Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and he had spent a quarter um, as a visitor in Chicago a long time ago, when my son Saul Bella was here. Um, and he, he, he volunteered, without prompting from me, um, the same view uh, that the intellectual climate at the University of Chicago is um, peerless. Um, and I continue to hold that view. And, um, uh, it, and, and I consider this place in many ways my intellectual home, and I, I bet many of you will also. Um, so it's really fun to be back um, speaking to you. Um, speak with you. Um, uh, I'm also, I just wanted to thank you, Mitchell, for inviting me, and, and also thank Brandon um, for helping me get here. 
and I'm working with a lot of logistics. So it's been a pleasure um, uh, getting to know you. Um, uh, I'm also I I'm impressed that you all are doing this as an institution because too seldom uh, the the um, pedagogical aspects of what we do are not focused on. Uh, and I think that's true throughout the university. There's a kind of feeling that the substance of what you teach is extremely many and requires years of training, but the way you teach it doesn't. And I think that's a mistake. Uh, it seems to me that um, the kind of fly by the seat of your pants approach to pedagogy that's prevalent uh, in law schools as well as uh, humanities and social science departments is, is regrettable. And so I'm really impressed and glad um, that the institution and you all are kind of paying attention to this aspect of what we do. It's enormously significant. I, I think just personally, um, when I you know, step back and think, is my life worthwhile? And it's what I'm doing sort of of, of substance. Um, it's the teaching part that sort of provides the, the most ready answer, if there is an answer. Um, if there is an answer, it's probably in the teaching. Um, so I'm glad that you're, you're thinking about it, and, and I welcome the opportunity to um, think with you about it. Um, I want to issue a couple of warnings, though. One is that I don't teach in a religion department. Um, indeed, I don't teach in a university. Brooklyn Law School is a standalone law school that's unconnected to any other university. And so it's a professional school um, with you know, central scholarly ambitions, but, um, but not a connection to a university. So that's a little bit different. It's not different, I think, from what happens across the midway. I, mean, I think what I do is pretty similar to what happens there. And so I guess it's the law school aspect of what I, what, what I will tell you about that differs from uh, the, the teaching setting in which many of you will find yourselves in the hall. Um, also, um, the subject matter that, that I'm going to use as the example here uh, is constitutional law, which only incidentally uh, concerns religion. In the course that I use as kind of the template for today, um, it, the religious freedom provisions of the Constitution are not central. So, um, so the subject matter is not identical to what you will be teaching. And finally, um, the classes that I'll use as kind of the paradigm for my thoughts about pedagogy are big classes, not seminars. So there are 80 students in these classes, or uh, this term I have 125. Uh, so that's, again, different from some of the teaching um, context that you'll find yourself. However, I do also teach seminars and colloquia, and um, you know, to the degree that uh, you're interested in it, we can sort of take our conversation in the direction of those different kind of teaching formats and, and, uh, and discuss the ways in which the lessons from big classes are generalizable or not generalizable. Um, I, I hope, I, I'll offer some thoughts in the first part of our time together, but, but I hope that you'll interrupt me if you have questions, and if this kind of evolves into more of a conversation, that will be a welcome development from my perspective. Um, as a way of knowing what your background is, I'd love to know, um, just by a show of hands, how many of you have done any teaching? Oh, oh wow, wow. Um, now, of those, how many of you were um, first TAs and then and then instructors in standalone classes? So, for TAs, what was the question again? Were you TAs or instructors in standalone classes? Okay, so you can raise your hand in both categories. Okay, and then, and then how about standalone classes? Okay, great. So that's helpful for me to know, um, you know a little bit about your background, and I hope that you'll um, share it with me um, in the discussion uh, as well, and, and um, help me to tailor kind of my comments to your concerns um, as we go forward. Um, so here's an outline of what I thought we would do. Um, I am now introducing the, uh, myself and uh, the talk, um, and then I thought I would I thought I would talk a little bit about um, syllabus, the syllabus and syllabus construction um, as a, as an element of uh, pedagogy. Then talk a little bit about in class interaction, um, mostly uh, first class discussion. So what happens in the conversation. Um, and the different ways in which in-class interaction can happen from lecturing to um, questioning the sort of Socratic method proper um, to uh, you know, volunteer comments from students. And then I thought I'd talk about multimedia because 
because this is an increasingly important um, part or dimension of pedagogy, at least in law schools, and I imagine in other parts of the university as well. And so I thought I'd give some attention to it. Um, as beginning with slides, which is the one the ones I'm using now, um, and then moving to video and, and then um, uh, website aids. And then finally, I thought I'd close by talking a little bit about feedback. Um, by which I mean not feedback that you give students, but feedback that students give you, and um, reverse feedback and how to make that kind of, um, useful, um, at least in my experience. Um, sound good? Is there anything, any topic that's not on here that you'd like to hear about? Maybe it won't look hurt you. Um, so should we begin with the syllabus? I, I, um, I know that it was available as a link, and there are some copies here. Um, I don't know how many people <coughs> really need a copy of this. Actually, there's more like sign in if people want. There's a sign in computer. I'm not going to go through any detail, but I thought you might like to see um, what what a syllabus looks like, or at least from my perspective. Um, so I, you know, somewhere in the craft of teaching uh, literature on the web, there's an intimidating quote from Jay Z Smith saying. And that the construction of the syllabus is the single you know, most important endeavor that a, that a teacher engages in. Um, I don't, I confess I'm not sure that's true for me. Um, I, mean, I, I, I take a lot of care with syllabi, but I'm, I'm not sure it's the part of what I do. But I do think it's important to have a syllabus and to have one that, um, that gives certain <coughs> types of guidance to students at the front end of the class. And, and let me tell you a little bit about why I think that is. The syllabus, you know, it serves different functions, as I just alluded to. Um, and I thought I could disaggregate some of those for you, just the way in which I think about a syllabus and how it serves these functions. In, in one way, it's a contract, right? So it's an exchange of promises. Um, I promise to teach the students certain things or guide them through a certain uh, uh, course. And they promise certain things to me as well in the syllabus. They promise to attend a certain amount, number of times, attend class. They promise to um, fulfill the course requirements, whatever those may be. Right? They promise to um, do the reading. Right? Um, I think it's important to set out those, those terms in a clear way at the start of the class, almost like a legal document. And, and then you can kind of back off of the formality. But I do think it's important to be clear at the start if you have an expectation that they'll be there for 75% of classes, it's important to say that at the outset. It's very hard to, to impose in a requirement like that after the fact. You know, it's almost like once the course starts, uh, starts, uh, that's an implicit you know, signal that they have accepted the terms of the course and that you have too, right? <laughs> and that the terms are good. But uh, if you try to impose some of these things midstream, it can be difficult because people say, well, I didn't have notice and so forth, right? So. I think it's important to set out in a clear way what the course requirements are, how the students will be assessed. Um, if you allocate um, you know, points or percentages of assessment to different instruments like an exam or a paper, I think it's important to say that at the outset as a matter of fairness. Um, I also think it's important to uh, tell them when you're going to meet um, and also um, what you're going to cover at each of those meetings. That maybe seems sort of self-evident, but um, it may be the case that uh, as you become busier, you know, you you can't adhere to the schedule that's set in the by the registrar or whatever. There'll be aberrations in the schedule, and I think as as you know, um, it's very important to tell the students in advance if, if you're not going to be on a certain day or and when the makeups will be and so forth. And um, I also think. It just helps build trust, and it treats them like grown-ups. So they can, you know, they can write this stuff into their calendar at the start of the term, and then know that, you know, if they want to go see their grandma, uh, they can. And they're not going to schedule class in the middle of that week. Or whatever. Um, I also think uh, I think it's a good idea to set out dates along with the topics of the course in advance. I know that this is a not a universally held practice or view among. So many people will hand out like sort of the first third of the syllabus at the beginning of the course, um, with just sometimes just with just topics and not um, dates. And then at the end of each class, they'll announce kind of what the reading is for the next class or something like that. 
um, or they'll you know they'll let the pace of the course be kind of somewhat natural and organic rather than fixed at the start of the course. I think that's not great for the students. Um, that's kind of my view, and I know that it's it's this is not a place where I'm articulating consensus. Um, I, because I think students like to know and have a sense of how the course will unfold and that you have a plan. <laughs> and not only as to what topics you cover, but what the pacing will look like. It's all revisable. Like this part totally is revisable. So um, it's perfectly okay to say to the students, you know, midway through, gosh, um, you know, uh, our discussion about um, the Commerce Clause power uh, was so fascinating. It just took us longer than I thought it would. Here's how I'm going to adjust the pace of the of the course as a consequence of that. That's something I think people respect, um, uh, even if it means you've got to change the dates on which you recover certain topics. So this is not like a contract. This is like um, <laughs> it's like a, a calendar, right? Um, where you're saying like, here's my plan for the course and how the pacing will work. Um, but it might not work that way for reasons that are pedagogically totally sound, right? Um, uh, like this, the class had a particular interest that you wanted to pursue, uh, and so there, I think revising the syllabus is totally is totally fine and it's commonplace practice. But I would say I would re I would recommend uh, giving a kind of sense of the entire course, including dates at the outset, and then changing it in response to things that happen in the industry. That's kind of my feeling about that. But I know that uh, colleagues of mine who are excellent teachers do it differently. Um, uh, I think you should give your contact information out of the syllabus. That's so silly, but uh, but it gives a sense to the students that you're available and you care about them. Um, uh, another thing that the syllabus does, and I suspect this is probably what Jay Z Smith was talking about, is it gives a it gives the students a conceptual structure for the course, an outline. And uh, this is something that students, I think, often don't realize the syllabus does, but it's important for you to realize it. That is, um, to think through at the beginning of the course, what are the topics that I will cover, and in what order will I cover them, right? Um, what are the subtopics, right? And so you'll see if you turn to um, page three where the syllabus proper begins, um, the second column is, the, is sort of an outline of the course. Um, here's the first topic. It's an introduction, not just to that day, but to the entire semester. Um, and then, uh, and then there's an outline in that column of the subtopics that will um, that we'll be covering over the course of the term. Um, again, for some reason, um, students have a tough time kind of realizing that that you're handing them an outline of the conceptual structure of the course. And sometimes you have to remind them during the course of the course. Okay, we're starting like. We're starting today not only a new class session, but a new chunk of the course, right? A new part or a new subpart. And to keep reminding them, kind of signposting them uh, for them where you are in the course, I think is extremely helpful to them because sometimes they can get um, kind of lost in the weeds. And, you know, they're very engaged in the details of whatever you're learning for a particular day, but they have less sense of. You know, why we're learning it now and how it relates to what we learned last week and what we're going to learn next week, right? Uh, and, and it's important for you to have a plan, you know, ha that there be a sense to this, right? Like, that you, that you understand. Now, it's not ironclad. Other teachers would follow different orders or have a different plan for how the course would unfold conceptually. But it's important to think about it in advance and, 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 um, and set it out. I think in a syllabus is, is helpful. Uh, the third column of the syllabus is the readings for that day from the casebook. I think in non-law classes, you won't have typically a single volume that sort of the, contains the bulk of the readings for the entire course. But that's the way it works in, in law schools. Um, there's nothing necessary about this. You can just put whatever readings are, are um, pertinent for that day. Um, but I've broken out, as you can see, um, sources of readings. So the second. Uh, the fourth column, rather, is the uh, readings that might be in the supplement to the casebook, which is a separate volume, like a loosely volume that's issued yearly. And then uh, in the fifth column, uh, readings that are available only on the course website, which for our course is called TWIN, but it's just an online resource for the course. Um, I did not provide any hard copy supplemental readings. 
I only provide them electronically. Um, it seems to me that um, that's sufficient for students, um, and it's much cheaper for everyone, um, and um, it's much easier for me, frankly, because it's easier to change readings, uh, substitute them, um, duplicate them from year to year, and so forth. Um, so I only let them, I only make them available electronically, and, I, and that seems fine to students. Um, the last column is an innovation, which is why it's blank for the first half of the course. Um, this is something that um, I developed in response to suggestions from students, and, and it, 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 <laughs> you have to page through the right thing at this point. Um, but the suggestion was, and I've come to think that this is a really useful thing, to set out in advance the questions that we'll focus on in the class session, so that while students are reading the materials before our class, they'll know what, what I care about, what I think is of interest, you know, what topics they should sort of be reflecting on as they read through the materials. Um, that seemed to me a great idea, um, and so I started to do it. My intention is, when I teach this course for the next time in the spring, um, to fill out that column for the entire course before the first day of class. So again, the idea is that students will have a sense of the organizing inquiries um, for that day as they're reading the material in advance. Um, I think it's a great idea. I, I, have a, I have a friend who teaches at another school who has a list of questions, um, a one sheet list of questions for each class session that he hands out before the class session. And then those are his teaching notes for that class session, just a single page. Um, that's a level of kind of artistry that I have not achieved. But, um, but this is a way of kind of approximating that approach, right? I mean, it's about the questions and not necessarily um, the answers, although you, you know where there are right answers <laughs> or no um, uh, That's it for the syllabus itself. Unless any of you have questions about the way this is laid out or how we're constructing the syllabi in general. There's an element of syllabus construction that raises a bigger issue that I thought I would discuss at this point. Um, was your question? Um, yes. Sure. So, I, I, I actually, I think that the question is common. I, I, I like that. I'm going I'm to play throughout this for you. Good. I'm enjoy it. So, um, that said, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about this in terms of, of undergraduates, especially, because right. that's you know, part of the, the, the dream is to, is to do that. But I wonder about the way in which uh, having an explicit statement of that sort of thing might limit the, the perception of the discussion for, for college students. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, um, I think that's a little bit worry. Right, so it could have a clarifying function, it also could have a constraining function, right? Um, and you would worry about that second thing. Um, you know, I think I'll just have to experiment with it. I didn't notice that um, when I started doing this at the end of last term, um, but it could it could well happen. You know, that people feel kind of um, like this list is ex is, is ex exclusive or exhaustive um, of the questions that are open for discussion on that day. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe there should be a caveat kind of at the beginning of the syllabus that disclaims mm -hmm. that, right? And just says these are kind of some of the questions you might. Um, because I think that the aspiration really is to aid students who don't know why they're reading a particular source, right? So they may be reading something and not understand why they're reading it or what they should be thinking about while they're reading it. Not that there's a should, but you know, what will we be talking about? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, my concern for this is, is that my, my biggest dread is question the effect of will this be on the exam? Uh, uh, so, so uh, I guess my, my word of all this being hypothetical would be something like, uh, oh, well, this question wasn't listed anywhere. <laughs> but, do you, you know what I mean? Like, right. I, I didn't know I should be thinking about this. And my, my response <laughs> would be different to say, yeah, you'd be thinking all the time. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. But, and that would be in, in another interesting disclaimer, right? So all questions are fair game. 
um, these are kind of guidance. Th these give you guidance, right, when you're doing the reading. Not, they're not kind of limiting in that sense. Um, I think those would be good caveats. In fact, I'm going to make a note there. <coughs> um, I think those would be good caveats to issue. Um, uh, you know, exam oriented learning is certainly something that law students are prone to. Um, and uh, I, my supposition, although I don't know if this is true, is that they're particularly prone to it because they're evaluated uh, on the basis of a single test at the end of the term, right? So that's not always the case for undergraduates, um, although maybe it is for undergraduate big classes. But um, uh, I also sort of think of law students as kind of less, uh, more instrumental in their learning. Um, uh, but I could be wrong about that. You know, it may be the case that undergraduates are also kind of very focused on the... My sense of those things are shaking. Really? Um, as a consequence of uh, the economy or changes in kind of uh, higher education culture? That one? Yeah. How is this going to get me a job? What are you going to do with your degree? Right. My response to that was great. Um, yeah, well, so to the degree that that's happening, you know, um, you, you, know you want to kind of uh, do two things, I think. One is um, give them clear answers, you know, how they will be evaluated at the outset. Because um, to the degree you can put those fears to rest or, or you know, tell them exactly how they're going to be evaluated, I think that can help, that can sort of lower the anxiety level. And open up space, kind of almost just psychological space, but also intellectual space for um, real engagement with ideas that are not uh, outcome oriented. Uh, so I do whatever I can to um, prepare them for the exam, including giving them all of the exams I've ever given, um, so they can look at them, um, giving them model answers to those exams, giving them opportunities whenever they want over the course of the term to write out. Um, Sample answers to those exams, and I will grade them, you know, so they can get practice. So um, just giving them as much kind of uh, support around exam taking as they feel like they need. This is a particularly important for first year law students who are, you know, not distinguishable in any meaningful way from undergraduates. I mean, many of them you know, just came right out of undergraduate, and they have the same mentality in, in many ways. Uh, but it's also true for for uh, more advanced law students. And then second, so, so reassuring them and helping them is one, one response. And then the other response is you're just fighting it. Like really getting them to think about the ideas as ideas um, in the class, um, even if that, that inquiry or that exchange is not tethered to um, outcome, right, to, to evaluation. Yeah. I have a different question. Yeah. I was just thinking, depending on the eagerness of your students, two, two statements on here could make this the only course that you have any time for. Uh, your first is that you invite people to stop by at any time uh, to your office hours, which I just struck me as incredibly generous. I don't know how long you're, often you're there, but um, I don't know how much they would take advantage of it. But that's, that's one that I'm just curious about. And the other is, um, yeah, the discussion board and how you decide when to post and when not to post, when to weigh in on a conversation, and what that, you know, how that affects the flow of the discussion. Yeah, um, the online discussion board. Yeah, right. Yeah. So as to um, availability, you know, um, that came about because um, I used to hold office hours and I found them unproductive. That is, oftentimes I'd be sort of chained to my desk at, for no reason. <laughs> and also, I wanted students to feel like they could come when they had a problem, not necessarily when I had to make time for them. Um, the truth is, it, it hasn't been debilitating. Um, they just don't come that much. Um, and when I am there, I really try to keep my door open and make sure that they feel welcome, and then they do come in. Sometimes really valuable things emerge that wouldn't have emerged, I think, if the timing hadn't been what it was. Right? So, I guess I would say, you know, play around with it, but I haven't found it. I have not found it debilitating. The discussion board um, is fascinating uh, because it's available for every course. And some years it takes off and other years it doesn't. And I really don't know 
why. Uh, it takes off some years and it doesn't other years. Um, it doesn't seem to be correlated with anything else. Like, um, you might think that if the class discussion is particularly lively, they'd want to sort of they want an outlet for continuing it after hours, right after the course. Um, but it doesn't seem like it's correlated with the liveliness of class discussion. Um, it sometimes maybe is correlated with um, current events that they want to sort of discuss outside of class. That's possible, but I'm not really sure. I just don't. I don't have a good explanation for it. The only pedagogical challenge that it presents, I guess, there are two things. One is when to post myself, right? Um, and um, because it changes the nature of the discourse, even if they know you're reading it, um, it changes the nature of the discourse to, to weigh in. Usually I don't post unless someone asks me a direct question, which they often do, like professor, and then I'll respond. Um, the only other time, and this gets to the second challenge, is when you need to intervene to um, police kind of norms of civility, which has happened a couple of times. People are more willing to criticize one another um, online than they are in person. Um, and so some, uh, on a couple of occasions, I've had to kind of remind them about the rules of the forum. And I think they're in here, too. Right? Um, so where I say, like, you're, you know, you're expected to sort of conduct yourself in a civil manner, which is not to say that um, debate shouldn't be robust and wide open and vigorous, but that there's a difference between that and um, and kind of act common in attack or um, uncharitable comments and so forth. I try to, remember, to remind them that um, the people in the class are their future professional network. That these are the people they'll rely on for jobs and so forth. They, they are forming a professional reputation right now, right? And, and that, that reminder sometimes helps to kind of, um, it's, it's more of a self interested approach, I guess, than a kind of. <laughs> Public values approach, uh, but it does it does tend to help. Yeah. Um, I just think there's time to this. So I noticed you have a number of readings on the syllabus that are more optional. Yes. And I'm I'm sure curious. Well, first, do people actually read them? And also, <laughs> yeah, so what 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 use do you make of the optional readings? In, you know, I mean, it's the temptation, I suppose, is to say, well, it's more Mercury or something. You know, there's tons of texts out there, and they should be reading all. Uh, sort of, you can't have to read everything for the class. You sort of put something on. That's the problem. Um, um, so I, you know, I'm very mindful of the amount of reading that they have for each class session, and uh, it's just not possible <coughs> within those constraints, just constraints of time and attention, um, to uh, to read everything that I think they would profit from reading. Um, so I give I give those optional readings as kind of um, as as kind of offerings to students who do have additional energy and interest, and and a lot of people um, pursue them. Um, in fact, um, if anything, I've gotten requests for more of that kind of thing um, because there are people who are kind of really curious intellectually about the ideas and they really want to pursue them. And a lot of times, the class discussion you know will be oriented by a literature that they have they haven't necessarily read. And, and where that happens, not that, not that I'll invoke authors they haven't read, but I'll invoke ideas that have been explored in the secondary literature. Um, and where that happens, sometimes people will you know, go on to read them themselves. So that the optional readings tend to be kind of canonical scholarly commentary on the law, uh, that each one of which stands for a kind of a big idea in that area. Uh, so, so I'll introduce the idea often in class, but if they want to go to the they, and many do, to my s somewhat surprise. Have you sort of changed your approach with, with optional texts? And, like, is it, have you found it's better to use more on some topics or less on others, or, or in, in general? I, I have changed my approach. I used to offer many more. Um, and I found it was kind of overwhelming. I actually think people read less when they're when you're giving them a ton of options. Whereas if you give them just a few, as you see, like, and there aren't any on the first page. Uh, you know, it's very, very infrequent. Um, they're, they're more apt to kind of pay attention to it. Like, there's probably some sort of finding of cultural cognition that explains this, <laughs> or, or um, cognitive psychology. Uh, um, so I, so I try to be kind of moderate in offering those. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. Just about, about the amount of readings and to talking about this. Um, uh, th are these the pages? The yes. So basically, there every time it has a 15 pages. Of course, it's law documents. So I'm sure. It's yeah, it's tiny print. print. Yeah. Uh, these are casebook pages. Yeah. But yeah, um, this this particular syllabus, um, I. I I taught for a term at Cornell Law School, and I found that the norms there were very different from the norms at Brooklyn Law School. That is, students read less. Um, so uh, the syllabus that I gave them was out of step with what they were getting from other professors, and that in it itself was a kind of cause for concern. So um, I think this syllabus is very kind of restricted in terms of the number of pages. There are definitely professors who assign a lot more, but I found that I can easily um, fill the class time with you know, based just on these readings. Um, are you are you um, looking at the amount of, of pages you give? Do you have like uh, some professors here that think okay for general uh, non-fictional reading, twenty pages will take an hour. So if you have three classes, how many how many hours can you ask students to put in their reading? So they calculate how many pages they can read. Yeah. Do you think that way? That's that fascinating. That way? I don't know. What, I don't know how that would help me. How many hours of reading would be appropriate for a single class session? It depends how many classes your student takes. Yeah. Generally. Right. So they take, let's say, four. And still, it doesn't help me really answer the question. But it, it is the case that, especially in this course, the, the reading is much slower at the beginning of the term for two reasons. First, the argot of constitutional law, you know, its, it's terminology, its discourse is unfamiliar to them. And um, until they learn it, they read very slowly. And second, um, the, the course is, by its nature, in part historical. So the cases that they read in the beginning of the term are older and harder to uh, they just uh, they use an unfamiliar um, structure as well as unfamiliar language. Uh, so uh, Marbury against Madison, for example, is only a few pages long, but they don't take them forever to read that case. Um, should take them forever. So I try to take that into account. On, so you can assign more pages as you get further into the term. On the other hand, um, as you get really late into the term, the demands on the time will increase because they're starting to um, study for exams and. Generally, other courses ramp up toward the end of the term. So I tend to cut back on reading at the end of the term uh, just out of recognition that their, their, their time constraints are greater at the end of the term. So I try to front load a little bit. But not in terms of the number of pages, I guess in terms of the number of hours that I expect it to take in term. <coughs> I hope that's responsive. Um, so another thing you may want to list on the syllabus, and I think this is a pedagogical question that cuts across all areas of teaching. It's been very controversial in law schools, though, and that is um, whether students are allowed to use laptops in class. Has, is this an issue for you? Yeah. Yes. So does it vary from professor to professor? Or? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So this is something to give some thought to. Um, and you know, where you come down on it is, I think, just depends what you think the best arguments are. Uh, but here are the arguments as I see them side of this issue. Okay. On the side of banning laptops, there are basically three arguments. Uh, two arguments about negative externalities and one is from paternalism. The, the first argument about ne negative externalities is that if you, if you are um, using your laptop for non-class related purposes during class, like you know, you're checking your website or shopping or whatever, um, that's distracting to the people who can see your screen. You know, the people behind you and around that's a negative externality. It's a cost that you're imposing on other people, right? And uh, I generally think um, you know that's not a good thing. The, the students that I teach are adults, and I think anyone that you teach are adults by some definition of that term. They can make decisions for themselves, and um, but it's not fair for them to make decisions for other people. So that's a concern, right? Another externality, negative externality, is um, that it can affect the class discussion. If a certain number of people are checked out um, because they're you know looking at baseball scores or whatever, that can impede the bigger 
or the liveliness of the class discussion for everybody, that imposes costs not only on people who are sitting right around them, but on the whole class. The, so those are the two negative externalities. And then there's a, there's a paternalism reason, uh, and that is this. Um, it seems to me that students who take notes on laptops, um, ha there's a strong temptation to just transcribe. So everything that gets said, they write down. Uh, because many students can, teach, can type that fast. And, and that means they don't have to think during class. The, the, the sort of thought is, I'll think about it later. Right? right now, I'm tired, it's 9 in the morning. Or I'm tired, it's right after lunch. Or I'm tired, it's late in the afternoon. <laughs> uh, like, only good time to teach is at 11 a.m. Uh, 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 so I'll just transcribe, and then I can process it later. Right? Uh, that's not good for them. I think it also is bad for the class discussion, but really now this is a paternalistic reason. It's, it's bad for people to transcribe, and it's not possible for handwriting. Um, you have to really digest what's happening as it's happening, and think about it, think about what's important before you write it down, and so forth. So those are the arguments against it, against laptop use. The arguments for it are you know, kind of anti-paternalism. That is, like, these are grown-ups, and they should be able to decide how to best how to run their lives. Um, also, um, for me, uh, the fact that the course materials are available electronically, and in some cases only electronically, militates against banning laptops. Because um, what ends up happening often is that, the, first of all, the students have to print out the course materials for that day and bring them in if they're going to refer to them in class. Second, um, what ends up happening is they'll take notes by hand, then they'll go home and type them into their computer, right? And that's how digitized the culture is. Because um, if, if something's on paper, it might as well be thrown away, right? It's not, these people do not have filing systems or notebooks or anything, right? Um, so um, that's a cost for students, and it's a cost that's kind of not consonant with the other ways in which the class is run. Also, I make the, slot, the PowerPoint slides, which I'll talk about in a minute, available to them. Um, after class, um, and that's an electronic resource that's kind of, there's a mismatch between that and their notes. Many times they'll take the slides after class and they'll mesh them with their notes so that the notes kind of match up with particular slides. That's not, it's just harder if you make them handwrite. So um, those are the reasons, I think, the best reasons not to ban laptops. Um, I tried it both ways, so one, one year I banned laptops, and I did not notice a change in the level of the class discussion. I just didn't think that the class was live there. Uh, um, after all, there are ways to check out that don't involve laptops, right? Like, I mean, the old school way, like we either do it. Also, there are lots of ways to access the internet that don't involve laptops, ways, right? Like tablets and phones and so forth, and you can't turn all that off. It turns out, at least in our school, it's technologically to turn off the internet in a particular room. You can't do it room by room. So that means the internet's going to be on, uh, and they're going to be accessing them. So, yeah. so, um, so that's how I came down on it, and, and I'm sticking with that decision. But it's something to think about, because at least in you know, where I teach, um, I think it's like half and half. Right? So half the professors been in laptops and half them. And I can see it going either way. And it might well depend on how digitized the rest of your course is. Right? If you have a very analog approach, generally, you might make more sense to ban laptops than if you don't, although some of the costs will still be imposed on students who don't share your analog approach. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, in the, in the spirit of uh, treating students as adults and laying out expectations on the syllabus, what do you think about naming some of these liabilities of either approach, right, the syllabus saying, you're welcome to use laptops for these reasons, yeah. um, if they're useful to you. However, please don't be a cost on other students by by shopping their and you know letting that be part of the explicit expectations. Yeah, that's a good idea. I probably did that. No, it doesn't seem to be in here. But um, I, I think that's a great idea. I'm going to do it. Um, I I guess I say something about it orally. <laughs> um, I give them a spiel that's like similar to the analysis I just laid out for you. Great, um, please turn off your <laughs> disable the Wi-Fi and enjoy your life. Yeah. There are some positive externalities to the internet as well, though, which is that um, you know, if, a, if a question of fact, for example, comes up in the course of the discussion, someone with the internet can look it up quickly, and that would benefit everybody. So that's a positive externality. <laughs> that can happen. And, but it's very rare, I think.
thing. So I, I do think that. When you said food is wrong. Only for me. <laughs> but even in such moments. You're really outnumbered. <laughs> no, that, yeah, that's right. Um, no, I think that's a good idea. Um, and it's in the spirit of kind of the notice function of the syllabus. Yeah, I like that idea. That's a good one. Um, should we move to class discussion? Oh, yeah, go ahead. I was wondering if you noticed the difference um, in large, with laptops and larger courses versus smaller courses. I mean, one sort of trend I've noticed here is that people are much kind of more willing to use uh, laptops in larger courses than in small ones. And I wonder Professors are more willing to allow. I think, yeah, but I think students who, I know I myself will take notes in a big lecture on a big lecture on a computer, but in a seminar, I do I find it awkward and strange, and I don't, that's just kind of my own impulse. Can you describe the awkwardness? I'm just interested. I, I think it's, I think it's uh, some of what you're talking about is that the transcription is, is not as important in like a seminar setting. Yeah. Um, and that it's, it's sort of more helpful for me to be able to set the job. Some of it is physical. Some of it's also like physical. Having this, having this thing in front of your face is, is also, I think, significant. Right. Even if you're not looking at it, there's a, it's a kind of barrier. It's a barrier, yeah. Right. So right. I, Which I makes less sense around the table, or it feels more intrusive. Right. It doesn't, I, I think so. So I was wondering if, you, if you've noticed any kind of. You know, I have, because there's a countervailing factor in, in seminars, which is that because you're talking directly at someone, it's sort of hard, it's easy to overcome the barriers of a laptop. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, it's yeah. harder for them to check out, I guess, and it's easier to access a particular student if you think they are, right? And it's, it's easier to draw their attention to the, uh, to the conversation by just saying, like, you know, asking them a question or bringing them in. So um, I haven't had a rule about it. I think that one year that I've been, I've been with all courses. Um, but, I, but, but I didn't find that um, there were dramatic uh, benefits to the class of conversation in either setting. Um, maybe, maybe part of that is because students kind of self-regulate, as you do, right? So they, they're less apt to use laptops in a seminar, or they're less apt to allow them to become kind of physical or psychological barriers to discussion in a small setting. Um, it's a really, it's an important pedagogical question, though, and I think one that we'll continue to wrestle with as teachers as time goes on and, and technology has changed. You know, whether it matters, but it's different if you have a tablet with like that that is flat with a keyboard, let's say, a Bluetooth keyboard. Maybe that's less intrusive in some ways. I don't know. Um, okay, so what about class discussion? Now, um, this is where the Socratic method part, I guess comes into play. And this part, I guess I won't go it because it's it likely to be less relevant to all of you because the Socratic method is something that's dominant, I'd say, in law schools, but not dominant elsewhere, even if it's used in other parts of the academy. Um, but uh, here, are your, here, are the, here are the kind of menu of, here's a menu of options, I guess, with regards to class discussion. One is lecture, right? So this is where, obviously, it's a one-way interaction. So uh, you are imparting information to students. Um, I find it's, it's I find there are advantages to lecturing. So it should be part of the mix, at least for me, uh, uh, in every class session, not just across the course. Uh, and I think here are the advantages. One is it's extremely efficient, right? So you can convey information in a relatively um, timely manner, and also in a manner that you can control completely. So the way the information unfolds uh, is within the teacher's control, uh, the structure of the ideas and so forth, and, and pacing, right? So that's helpful. Also, I think it helps to um, convey a sense of authority, uh, which is something you're, you're, this dynamic is something you're going to want to pay attention to as a teacher. You know, to, to, to what degree and in what ways do you wish to um, present yourself and be perceived as an authority figure in this field, you know, an expert, um, someone who's controlling the uh, interactions. Um, and to what degree, you know, do you wish to be viewed as a conversation partner, right, or someone who's there to kind of help the students elicit their own kind of conceptions of the idea. Those are, I think, complementary functions, but, but, so for me, the question is not whether, but to what degree, right, so how much do you want each of these kind of roles to be um, I also think that lecturing can do something that class discussion can, and that is inspire. 
right? So it is possible using the lecture to really fire people up, um, get them to understand the importance of the topic. Um, by setting the historical context of a particular topic, you can um, impart a sense of the urgency that people felt at that time, the reason they might feel urgency around that topic now, right? So you can wake people up and get them sort of paying attention and tell them why they should care about what they're about to learn, right? Uh, that is something that's hard to do in a back and forth, right, in a pure and Socratic. Uh, you can do it, but it's a little bit harder. Whereas if, you, if you're conveying information, it's easier, right? Um, so that's kind of lecturing. And then the next tool is the Socratic method. I don't mean this in any like technical sense. I did not go back to Socrates' writings in order to like paraphrase this. Um, I have not read any any um, pedagogical tracts on the Socratic method. Um, I have not um, studied it. Actually, so this this just comes from practical experience. What does it mean? I mean, in its simplest, it's a question and answer method, right? So where you ask students questions um, at usually at random, meaning like they don't know that they're going to be called on a given day, um, and through the questions you seek to enhance or increase their understanding of the material. Right? So you ask them questions and they give you answers. And then you ask them more questions. Right? So, uh, you might say, uh, you know, what's the basic teaching of this case? Um, OK, what if the car were blue? Um, what if the car were a train? Um, what if the vehicle were a bike? Would that change your answer? The point of the questioning is to get them to think about the purposes behind a particular idea or rule, and then also its limits. What are the what's the scope of this rule? How far would you take it? Right? What are the countervailing considerations? And so forth. It has a particular use in law, I think, because students are are being trained to act as advocates, meaning they don't know necessarily which side of a particular issue they're going to be representing in a particular case. That depends on who their client is, right? So it's really important for them to be able to understand an issue from all or both sides. It's also important because they have to be able to anticipate, whichever side they're on, what the other side is going to say, what the other side's strongest arguments are, so they can be ready, right? Um, so they're trained to be professional advocates, so for that reason, it's, it's kind of important and relevant. And I think that was the original idea behind introducing the Socratic method in law school. This was done at Harvard Law School in the early 20th century. Um, but, it, I think it helps in lots of other areas as well. I mean, after all, um, ethicists for sure deal with arguments, but we all do it some, to some degree, right? I mean, all scholars deal with arguments. Um, and so if you're going to know how to form an argument, and how to strengthen it, how to defend against uh, objections, it's helpful to uh, be able to press students to understand what the objections are and to try to form the answers to them. So, uh, so that's like kind of, I think, the most basic, kind of most conceptual reason for using the Socratic method. Another reason is just that you wake people up. You know, I, mean, I think if you have to speak in a class, or you think you're going to have to speak, or your person next to you is speaking, um, it, it's less it, it's less deadening than if someone is talking at you for 45 minutes. You know, having someone talk at you for 45 minutes or even 20 minutes is hard, whoever you are, you know, whatever the context. But um, if you're a relatively young student and you know you know, interesting ideas, and you've been out late the night before, and this is your third class of the day, you know, it's helpful to have a class discussion, right? Just to get people, get people talking. Uh, it just helps. Uh, and I think it helps um, them to be able to think about, like, so what if I get called on next? What will I say? What's up next? You know, what are my ideas about this? How, what do I think about what my colleague is saying? And so forth, right? And then finally, it kind of humanizes the experience. Um, to hear one of a peer kind of engage in a dialogue like this um, lets people know that the way they're thinking about the problem is shared by other people and is not stupid and um, is uh, worthwhile. Um, and I think that's helpful. Um, whereas if, a, if someone's lecturing at you for the entire time, that's kind of hard for sometimes, right? Um, uh, I think it's important in those exchanges to try to adhere to a few kind of rules of thumb or kind of principles. One is um, when a student says something wrong, it's important to tell them that they have said something wrong in clear terms. Uh, it's, very, uh, it's very tempting for me anyway to just kind of say that everyone's comments are great and 
praise people because it helps it helps encourage conversation and, and I genuinely believe it 98% of the time. But when someone says something that's just objectively correct, I think it helps everyone in certain helps everyone to say that and serves no one to be unclear about it. Um, so that's one thing. Another kind of principle I think that's helpful is to keep track of, and this is sort of like this is approach is kind of the master level, but um, is to keep track of people's positions on issues over time. Um, because it's enormously powerful if you can invoke a comment or a position that someone took earlier in the conversation or earlier in the term in a new context. That can be like an aha kind of moment. So um, if, in, if in the course of a conversation, um, someone's position from an earlier moment becomes relevant to that conversation, and you, and you call on them, and they don't know why you're calling on them, and then you help them understand why you're calling on them, it can help make connections between parts of the course that they might not have understood or related. Um, uh, so that's a very helpful kind of way of um, using the scribe method, but it's also very difficult. Um, finally, I would say, just as like a rudimentary tip, it's, it's also very helpful if at the end of a Socratic discussion and exchange, you can sum up the key points um, for the students. Because a downside or a danger of the scribe method is that the students don't know what to take away from the interaction. You know, what, is, what are the important or salient points here? Um, uh, some of that will be a matter of judgment for them or of opinion. Um, but some of it isn't, you know, they, you, even if it's just like, here's the issue that you know is important in this area and, and around which you want to develop a kind of perspective, and rather than giving them the perspective that they should develop. Right? And just to summarize and structure what's happened, I think is very helpful. And uh, another danger is that students will, um, you know, will engage in excessive opinionizing or sort of They'll just, they'll, they'll just sort of state their view of the world in a way that's not connected to the topic, and that can be difficult. Um, and then the third, the third way of having a class discussion, of course, is, is to take volunteers from the students. So if students have questions or want to make comments, they, they will volunteer, and that's awesome. Um, because it increases the energy level, and it brings, it gives you information about what they're understanding, what they're not understanding, uh, and also what they're, where their interests lie. But there are dangers there, too. The chief one is that a certain small number of opinionated students will come to dominate um, that aspect of the discussion. Um, and that's just hard. You know, these are volunteers, so by definition, you can't elicit them. Um, you know, all you can do is kind of ignore people who have talked too long and not, not, and, you know, not give them a chance to speak when they raise their hand in the hope that other students will kind of volunteer. And that does sometimes happen. Um, uh, there is, I've noticed over the years, no necessary correlation between willingness to speak and, and quality of comment. <laughs> There's not a negative correlation, right? So it's not that people who are willing to speak a lot are, you know, are necessarily giving the worst answers or the low quality answers. Um, but there's just no correlation at all. So there's, they're just scattered across the spectrum. Um, and that's just, that just comes with the territory. There's sort of upsides and downsides to each of these kinds of each of these um, items on the menu of you know, options for class discussion. And, um, taking volunteers out of the zone. Um, another possibility that I don't pursue in constitutional law, but I do in other areas, is you can assign problems or hypotheticals to students in advance. You can get them to sign up at the start of the term to take responsibility for hypotheticals or problems before class, and then in the class discussion, those people take the lead on those problems. Um, I found that extremely beneficial in certain subject matters, um, and it's something to consider. Sometimes students will post short, you know, one or two paragraph answers to the problem before class on the course website. That would be a course requirement. They'll do that maybe once over the course of the term. Um, but it can lend a, a real kind of authoritativeness to student comments about hypotheticals. They've really thought about it hard. Um, and when they disagree and they've thought about it hard, that's like even better, right? So you can really get some good discussion right now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you have a question? Uh, I, I do, but it requires a step back. That's okay. Time. I can go of, uh, not contributing to anything on the moment of talk. Um, you mentioned the danger of students uh, 
overly opining or just speaking their, their view on things. Um, and purely hypothetically, if you have a student doing this, uh, do you have a suggestion for dealing with this? <laughs> purely as a, as a hypothetical. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's a hard one to, it's a hard one to manage. Um, the best thing to do, I think, is just to try to move on. Uh, you can even flag the comment as an opinion. Like, you can say something like, that's an interesting perspective, or uh, that's an interesting view, or something like that. Um, and then just move, and then just try to move on. Um, I don't think, in my experience, it's the risk of offending that person by moving on quickly is very low. The, the danger is that other students will get annoyed that mm -hmm. that, is, you know, that, that student is climbing rather than kind of trying to engage in the analysis or further the you know, move the discussion forward. Um, and sometimes the, the distinction between kind of giving an opinion and interpreting a clause of the Constitution or you know, trying to figure out what the, problem, the answer to the problem is can be very thin, right? I mean, it's not at all clear sometimes what the difference is. And I mean, you all are engaged in numerous aspects of the study of religion and interpretation, and so are we in law. And when you're interpreting things, there can be opinions about the right interpretation, right? I mean, that's an opinion, I suppose. Um, what I mean by opinion is like, a personal opinion or a political opinion that's relatively disconnected from the subject matter. You know, I think that this should come out right because, you know, I don't know what it is. Blue is the most beautiful color. That's an extreme. <laughs> yeah. I guess I have, um, in addition to an inverse question, which is, I find the, the Socratic method very compelling as a, as a pedagogical tool, but I, I want to be sensitive to students who don't process um, we don't process their thoughts well or readily in that kind of um, in that kind of situation. I realize that it might be a different issue in a law school where there are certain expectations of the yeah. career path, but I think in especially in college that that's not going to be the case. I mean, this is the problem that I have, which I think makes it all the more important to be aware of it and to be able to deal with it respectfully and productively. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I focus on that one word that you use, which is respect. Like I think you just have to realize that some students are not, this is not going to be their cup of tea. Um, in law school, we, as I said, we call people randomly, which means I'm going to call everyone. I mean, it's going to be even handed across, across the term. And some people just, it's, they're terrified, and they, um, and they don't do particularly well, and they don't enjoy it, and so forth. And I think in those circumstances, I mean, this is where it becomes really, a, this is one of the places where it becomes an art. And you just have to know when to move on to someone else, right? Or, um, or engage with them kind of in the right way so that they feel you can be disarming, right? So um, self-effacing, or you can help them in ways that um, that aren't substantive but make them feel like you're talking about the problem with them rather than asking them questions or talking to them. So you can say, for example, um, if they're having trouble, uh, let, me, let, me get, let me lay out the facts of the case before we start talking. Right? And then you can you can sort of volunteer a part of it for them. It's not none of that is the conceptually difficult part. It's not the part you care about, right? But just talking with them about the case and helping them along in the beginning can help some students. Other students, they're they're just going to be lost, and then you should just kind of move on. Um, and I think um, routinely when I get feedback, uh, people appreciate kind of respect around those differences, mm -hmm. um, and you know, and you kind of hope that people will contribute to cost discussion. And Uh, but to the degree you can help them, you know, draw them out or make them feel at ease or uh, say something disarming or help them. Yeah. So it seems like the Socratic method, you have the advantage of um, being able to maintain a level of control that you don't necessarily have in the sort of volunteering system because you're the one asking questions. Um, yeah, but not as much control as with the lecture. Right, right, right. right. So it's sort of an intermediate step. So I was wondering sort of on that question of control. Uh, and like maintaining, like I, like I assume that for every lecture, and even to some degree in the syllabus, you have to like what like certain points that you're going to hit. Yes. But I know that with discussion sessions, that they often take on like a life of their own, and they sort right. of just. And is it ultimately just the same sort of thing as the last answer, where it's just like a balance that you kind of find, a sense that you have as someone's done it before, that guides you, or do you have specific like, sort of techniques and tactics that you use to like? Okay, well, this discussion is very interesting. But we need yeah. to. Or do you just say that? I'm glad you asked that question. Yeah. No, so I, um, it's it's no. There's more to say about this. I mean, it's not like my answer to the last question. So, okay. 
Um, I'd, I'd say there are two guidelines that I'd offer if you're really going to get involved in this and that are essential. One is you need to know what the answers are and what, where you're going. Right? So the fact that you're having a question and answer dialogue does not mean that there are not lessons that need to be imparted. Right? I mean, there are, there are takeaways that you need to elicit. Right? Um, which may include, you know, what's the, in, in, my, in my area, what's the legal rule in this case? What are the reasons for it? What are its limits? Right? What are the policy reasons that sort of militate for and against this particular rule? And you know, how will it get applied in certain situations? Right? So you, you, you want to make sure you hit those points. So it cannot be kind of a free-flowing, totally free-flowing structure, even if the students don't realize it. The second thing is, um, I found that it's very helpful as a kind of self-constraining rule to only ask real questions. Not questions you know the answer to. Not like, what are the facts of this case? Or what's the whole thing in this case? But real questions, like, um, what's the best reason for this outcome? You know, what would happen if the, what, if, what would happen if the situation were altered? How far, how far should the court take it? What are the ramifications in the real world if the court sets the, um, sets the, the incentive structure this way rather than that way, right? Like, I think that's really important it, it, in a couple of ways. Like one danger of the Socratic method is, is it can feel like a power trip on the part of a professor who knows all the answers and it's like a hot ball kind of thing. Right. Yeah. You know, are you sure that's the right answer? <laughs> 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 that, 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 that is not the point of it. That is not the point of it. It's not a lecture in disguise. Right? It's not that. It's um, it's a gen it should be a genuine interaction where you're answering real questions that have you know, uncertain answers or there are, there are multiple ways to answer them. Um, now it might take a while to get to that point, and sometimes you know you might want to lay out the facts to the student or whatever in the way that I described. But that's the goal, right? That's the place you want to be. Is that one? yeah? Right. Uh, yeah. Just on this, and you, I could ask it at the end, but. Are you a different kind of professor at Brooklyn Law School because of your studies in religion and your doctorate in religion? That's a good question. Pedagogically, substantively? I hope so. <laughs> I mean, so certainly, um, certainly as a matter of substance, that's true, particularly when I'm teaching subjects that relate to religion, right? Um, so, um, you know, so when I teach uh, religious freedom courses, um, there's no question that um, uh, that issues like the you know, how to define the concept of religion that crop up in law are you know kind of informed at their core for me by you know the training here, and um, um, and I I think and so, so substantively that's definitely true. But what about areas where that there is no substantive overlap, right? It's like constitutional law about the power of, the, of Congress to pass laws and the Congress laws and stuff like that. I mean, so I would hope and I think that it's true that this, the style of kind of respectful but very intense engagement um, that I learned here uh, is something that's different um, for me than it is for other people. Um, you know, there's a, it's really important to understand the distinction between I want to use the word aggressive. I will use the word aggressive engagement and disrespectful engagement. That, those are not the same thing. Um, and that's true in the classroom as well, in scholarly endeavors. And uh, I think that difference is one that's sort of really essential to the culture here. Um, but in law schools, um, it often gets elided. So people think that being respectful means not, not pressing as hard on ideas, right? And um, uh, that's not. That's not <coughs> Um, I also think that the importance of the intellectual side, apart from pragmatic concerns, um, is is a value that I cherish and, and try to bring to the class. At the same time as I respect the students' kind of concern that um, what they learn in law school should have practical effect, right? And so there's a there's a kind of tension there. I think that's true in certainly in, in ministry ministry. But it's very true in law schools. I mean, the, 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 the kind of law schools kind of occupy a, and 
students choose scholarship as well as the teaching, the mid-level of abstraction between sort of on the one hand very pragmatic kind of technical stuff, and on the other hand, you know, very abstract moral philosophizing. Um, and um, when you're occupying that middle realm, it's it's tempting sometimes to discount the value of ideas, and I think that's it's important not to do that. So uh, so I see an influence there, but that's more tangential. All right, what about multimedia? I don't. Yeah. Okay, okay, so Sure. Yeah. Uh, just, I was interested in what you said about uh, questioning your students not being a uh, lecturer in disguise. Yeah. Um, full disclosure, I currently one of the things I'm teaching is uh, in the social science core in college. Uh, and next Thursday, every uh, quarter, he is lead one of the sessions. So next week, I'm doing uh, harness on law, actually. <laughs> Great. But. Um, the way that the lecturer has been, well, the, the, the instructor has been handling the class is basically questioning the lower lecturers. Guys. Like everything is questioning the students. It's not so much calling on specific people, it's open questions, but it is fact, sort of facts. The facts of the reading are what we're attacking. You know, you know, in Aristotle politics, you know, I mean, you know, this is fair for the government. You know, and there is an answer because he says what it is. Yeah. Uh, and we're trying to sort of fish for that get them to, to talk that out. Um, so I was wondering if your criticism of that was just sort of a, a personal preference on your part, or if you if it was deeper than that, that you saw it sort of pedagogically damaging. Um, so I'm curious what you're getting about C6. Yeah, so um, you know, I want to say just that the different teaching settings may matter here. You know, there may be a culture or a way of teaching that's kind of customary uh, in, in that discipline or in that, that level of education. So yeah. I want to sort of be careful all around here. But but for me in my own classes, I find that um, it's it's much more effective to um, try to learn with the students. I mean these are these are questions that are genuinely hard and, and uh, they take some work um, to figure out um, not necessarily the answer, but like your approach to them, or how what analytic framework you're going to use to figure out you know whether um, a, whether an act of government violates the fair share clause, for example. Uh, and uh, my own you know view, maybe maybe even prejudice, is that um, question and answer is not a great way to kind of impart information or get this you know sort of rehearse what's in 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 the reading, um, but rather it's a, it's it's more effective as a genuine collaboration or dialogue where the students you earn their trust, right? By getting them to realize that you're not just this isn't um, this isn't just an exercise in like sort of you know getting them to say the right answer or the right answer a fact you know from their own mouths. I, I for me I think that. Um, is corrosive of trust. Um, what you want is, even in a huge class, um, is to give them a sense that you know, the, when they think that an issue is hard, where it is hard, you know, where there isn't, you, you know, to validate that and then work through it with them. What are the arguments on each side? What, what they're really going to take away from your class is not you know, what Aristotle said. What they're going to take away from me or my class. Um, what they're going to take away is, you know, um, what are the hard problems? In you know legal jurisprudence, and what are you know the ways to think about them that are most helpful? What are the ways that you know kind of I'm drawn to, knowing that there are strong arguments on the other side? Right? I hope that's not too evasive, but that is a particular. Can I try to offer a dialogue? Because yeah. another uh, somehow you've got to get a baseline of what's the thesis of this book? What are the essential? Facts of the case as we can know them, and if that always comes from you rather than from them, does it both get them off the hook and perhaps give you more control over defining what the data set is than you would want to have, or than you think is it just logically justified? Yeah, sometimes. Especially where the facts are unclear, or um, uh, you know, where they're an issue or something. Yeah. Um, 
And oftentimes they're not, though. Some, my own goal is to not discuss the facts in class, right? And to assume that people have read the material and then to take it from there. Um, but with very new students, it's not always possible to do that. It's, it's sometimes important to, um, uh, to get the facts out on the table in the class discussion. And, you know, I guess what Aristotle said about X would be kind of a fact in this, in this sense, right? Um, but, but there, I think, it's not really surprising that you could just say to the student, you know, um, right, why don't you just recall the facts for us? That's not, I mean, I guess it's a question, but it's not, it's not a surprise question. That's just, you know, let's get the facts on the table. And then they're on the table, and then you can ask, you know, what's driving this thing? Yeah. So this is, is sort of building on, on this topic that we've been on. Is um, the question about the uh, the interrelation of the lecturing and discussion? Because I know you said that it was something you try to do every yes class period. So is there is there a relation that you like, consciously structure between? I mean, imagine so between like the lecture and the discussion. And I don't know if you could just speak a little bit about like how they sort of you know, play off each other as you. Yeah. Generally, so um, I found that lecturing is especially helpful when you're when you're framing a discussion, a new topic. Right, so, or concluding the talk, right? So those are the moments when I, and that could come at the end of class, the beginning of class, but they, they might not, uh, depending on how the conversation is structured, right? So uh, when you're introducing a topic, I think it's helpful sometimes to kind of uh, review what you did last class, kind of get that in people's minds, then give a transition to this class, remind people where we are in the course, what the topic is for the day, right? Give them a sense of what we're gonna cover for the next, you know, hour and a half, and then um, and then kind of introduce the subtopic that you're going to deal with first, um, and then at the end of the discussion, it's helpful to kind of lecture again and recap. So those are some places, and then there are places where it's helpful to lecture just independent of those considerations. Like for example, some sometimes the casebook won't, uh, or the whatever materials you're using won't um, relay the history around a particular event in the way that you think is best, and so you'll just like lecture that. Right. That's, that's one of the things in my larger question is the, is we're talking about like delivering the facts to people. Is, is yeah. that, so is that what you primarily use lectures for? Is that to deliver the fact that the context, the, the background information that's sort of vital to understanding it? And sort of, but that's somewhat facts of the matter, right? That's, sort of that's, one, that, that's one thing. Yeah, that's one way I use lecture. But another is, again, framing. You know, uh, so where are we in the course? What's the topic? What you know? What do we care about? What are our objectives for this class session? That kind of stuff, right? And, and then you know, sometimes here's what was going on in the, you know, in the background of this case. And here's why it matters. So here's where we're going. And so I don't know if you if you all have used uh, multimedia or slides uh, in teaching, but I have some strong views about how to do that, and uh, so. You know, I'm just going to issue a caveat, which is that these are idiosyncratic views, uh, like all the ones I'm sharing with you today. Um, uh, so there is a lot of disagreement about how to how best to use PowerPoint and other um, multimedia tools. Um, but I, but I I have thought about it a lot um, and experimented, and so you know these opinions are somewhat I don't know informed um, by the that thinking and that experimentation. Um, so I think there are a couple of ways that it's helpful to use PowerPoint slides, and then there's some ways that it's not helpful to use PowerPoint slides. And I'll try to convey, um, especially the one, the, the types of uses of PowerPoint slides that I think is helpful. Um, one way to, that's helpful to use them is the way that I've been using them so far in this conversation, which is just to give the students a visual depiction of the structure of a discussion, right? So an outline of. Uh, or a plan, a roadmap um, for what you're going to do that day. Um, I always do this at the beginning of class. You know, here's here are the topics for today and the subtopics, just the way that I've done it for you. Here's an example of this from like an actual constitutional law class. Um, I would just say the topic for today is rational basis review. Here's how we're going to do it. We're going to sort of look at tiers of scrutiny um, in general, introduce the idea, and then we'll look look at rational basis review in particular. Those two bullet points are. Cases that we looked at, um, and then um, the third topic, you know, is there such a thing as rational basis plus, and then we'll talk about that in the context of the case. And I think this is very helpful. This is um, text, but it's text that's displayed in a in a 
tabular form or an outline, a schematic form. So what you're conveying to them is not just text, but also levels of generality and organization, right? Um, and that's conveyed visually, right, in, in, in an outline form. Um, so I don't think it's helpful to display text on PowerPoint slides as a general rule. Um, and I think one mistake that people make with PowerPoint slides is displaying lots of text. It's not a good idea. There are comparative advantages um, to PowerPoint, and displaying text is not one of them. Um, text, you know, textual con con um, information flow is something that happens in reading, right? And so the students will have plenty of interaction with text when they prepare for class. Um, what PowerPoint can do, if it's used well, is provide a different kind of information flow, right? That complements, but is not the same thing as the type of learning that happens when you read something. Um, so typically, um, the, that information flow will be obviously visual. I mean, it's a visual aid, right? So the, the, the challenge is to think about how do people learn visually, some types of people more than others, and, and how can you take advantage of that different style or mode of learning, and how can you leverage it in a maximally efficient way using PowerPoint slides? And I think there are bunches of ways, there are bunches of ways to do that. Uh, one of them is you know, using outlines because the outlines are visual. Yeah. Um, I mean, the fact that something is indented means it's a subtopic, right? Um, and that speaks to some people in a different way than text does. Um, another way to use PowerPoint slides that's effective is, is just displaying images. Um, and you can display images for lots of different reasons. Um, this is an image of broccoli. Um, it's really a <laughs> right. right, so like, this is about the broccoli argument. You know, um, if, you, if you can force people uh, to purchase health care, why can't you force them to purchase broccoli, right? Um, it's why why display this image? You might think, right? I mean, it doesn't convey a complex idea. It's not why do this, right? And I think there are two reasons. One is it's just an, it, it, it it introduces some diversity of information flow in the room. You know that people just you haven't seen until now an image of broccoli or anything else in our conversation. Another reason is the mind. You will remember this slide. Right? And when you think of the broccoli argument, or the students will, like, what they'll remember is the slide. And that can often, especially for certain students, trigger um, other types of memories, you know, the rule in the case, or the discussion, or what happened, and so forth. Uh, and then the third reason is that images can be, they can have emotional impact um, in a way that, that words, um, in a different way from words. Right? So and this, is, this varies by person. Right? So this, you know, the, um, what I'm saying interacts with you know, the ideas of multiple intelligences and so forth. But some people have an emotional res you know, reaction to a broccoli or a prostate or a negative. Uh, uh, and that can be helpful because it just activates a different part of their person, of their intellect, right? Um, images can be useful in other ways, too. Um, oh, this is another example of you know, emotional impact. So this is... Uh, um, this is a member of Westboro Baptist Church um, protesting outside the funeral of a fallen soldier. Um, and uh, again, like when you're talking about this case, this kind of resonates with people in a different way from just sort of describing, well, there were picketers outside and they had, you know, kind of objectionable signs um, or, um, that they were displaying. Uh, again, it can also function as a mnemonic device, especially when you tell people like virtually every member of the Westboro Baptist Church is a member of Fred Phelps' family, including this woman who is his daughter. Um, you can tell students that during Jim Crow, it was necessary for African Americans to have guidebooks so that they could know when they were traveling which hotels and restaurants would serve them. But showing them the cover of the book is different. Like, this thing really existed. And people really needed this, right? Um, it has a different kind of mnemonic emotional resonance, I think, than just describing the fact of the dream book. That's my conviction. Um, maps can be useful, 
right? I mean, these are these convey visual information in a different way um, from what we've been talking about so far. So it's another category of usefulness um, for uh, visual information. That's true of charts and graphs and so forth as well, as long as they're used in a in a smart and you know, sort of discriminating way. Um, this map, for example, um, shows census tracts in uh, my hometown of Brooklyn, New York. Um, and the colors represent uh, racial housing segregation. So uh, residential housing patterns by race. Um, and you can see if you look at the you know, neighborhood that Brooklyn, like most neighborhoods in New York City and other cities, is heavily segregated by race. Um, the next slide shows school zones in Brooklyn. And by flipping back and forth, you can get students to see that the school zones exactly overlap housing patterns by race in Brooklyn, New York. So it's in 17 and 16, which are the black school zone in Brooklyn. Um, and uh, zone 15 is the you know, white school zone, sometimes affectionately referred to as Manhattan. <laughs> um, I think um, that's another way to use PowerPoint slides that is not text-based, that it conveys information in kind of a different way from other, um, other tools at your disposal. Finally, there's tabular kind of chart kind of ways of organizing information. There's text involved in this, but um, it allows students to organize ideas in a way that it would be hard to do kind of verbally. And some, again, this isn't true for all students, but for many students, uh, this kind of organization of ideas will uh, be more effective um, than other kinds of logical organization. Um, this is another example of kind of tabular uh, representation of ideas. This is the holding of Roe against Wade, where um, in the first trimester of pregnancy, no regulation is allowed under the Constitution. In the second trimester, regulation is reasonably re that's reasonably related to the health of the mother is allowed. Um, and that's allowed in the third trimester as well, where um, outright prohibition is allowed under the Constitution, except where necessary to preserve the health or life of the mother. And Casey uh, was the case that reaffirmed Roe. Um, and many people think it's just sort of reaffirmed the the holding of Roe, but this chart shows that it actually altered the holding of Roe in a significant way um, by allowing regulation even in the first trimester, so long as an undue burden isn't imposed on the ability of the woman to terminate her pregnancy. Um, so, it sh so it shows the kind of ways in which the holding of Roe was maintained, but also the ways in which the holding of Roe was altered. This is hard to do purely verbally. Uh, I mean, you can do it, but it's this will resonate with some people better. Um, and the um, this exact slide, but without the purple part, without Casey, um, it, it is I use in the row class. And then the next class, you add this bar, and it kind of has an impact. Um, so that's another way I think that PowerPoint can be useful. I'd say um, another rule of thumb with PowerPoint is is really be very sparing with the number of slides that you use. You know, people can only take in a certain number of slides per session. And one mistake that people use is they kind of overwhelm students with slides. Reading text off a slide is an absolute no-no. Like, do not read text off of PowerPoint slides. It's, it's death to a conversation. <laughs> Don't use PowerPoint slides as your notes, as your teaching notes. That is not a good idea. Um, you know, you should know where this is going independent of the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint serves you. You don't serve the PowerPoint, right? Like, this is a tool that you should be in control of. Yeah? Okay, um, so I have kind of a, a summary remark, because um, everything you said about um, non-text related um, slides is very helpful to me, um, especially at this latter point, it makes a lot of sense. However, I think that the comment about using texts on PowerPoint kind of maps on the discussion we've already had. There seems to be the distinction between undergraduate teaching and professional school or, or post undergraduate teaching. Because I mean, for me personally, you know, teaching an intro to philosophy class requires that you know, students need to know how to formalize an argument. They're looking at those, they don't know what to do with it. 
Right. You don't know what's a premise, what's the conclusion. So I've made it a habit where I bring in certain select texts, I throw them on a Word document, you need over for everybody to look at on the board, and then we work through. The what? Okay, I'm glad you said that, because I, I was about to introduce an exception to the oh, no text okay. rule, right? <laughs> <laughs> and the exception is where there's language that you're interpreting, yeah. and it's very particular, then I think it can be really helpful. Okay. Because sometimes you really need to look at the text in order to see um, how it's situated, uh, give a little bit of context. This is the 14th Amendment, for example. And the different colors represent the different clauses as people that people know from the 14th Amendment. You know, this is the um, um, Equal Protection Clause, for example. Yeah. Um, uh, when you're kind of working through the interpretation of specific terms, then I think it sometimes is useful to have the text in front of everyone. So you can just refer to it together. Exactly. Right. Um, I do think that could be helpful. I think there's one other exception, which is um, if you have a problem, like a hypothetical, that you're offering to the class, if it's at all complicated, it's sometimes helpful to offer the hypothetical in, in, you know, as a slide. Yeah. This is a big block of text, so it, you know, it, it contradicts my rule. Um, but you know, we're going to spend half an hour talking about this as a class. Um, if I just said this, I mean, I do say it, but not, not word for word, but um, people would forget, and, and um, they might not know what we're talking about. It's a kind of topic slide for that section of the course, and so I, I think in this situation, it's kind of helpful to have the text as well, but just be really careful, yeah. I'd say. Use it sparingly. Uh, but so, so I agree, I agree with that. Um, finally, uh, oh, another way to use PowerPoint is um, humor. I think, don't underestimate the, the power of humor. Uh, this is the right to bear arms. Um, <laughs> um, you know, why use humor? Uh, it it just, you know, it brings energy to the room, it lightens the mood. Um, it's, uh, it, can, it can serve a mnemonic function. People will remember jokes in a way that they might not remember other things. Um, uh, and especially if the joke is visual. Right, like this one is. Um, you can't convey this joke, or you just can't do it verbally, right? Uh, but you can do it using the image. Um, okay, so the last thing I want to talk about um, with regard to multimedia is just um, the use of video. Uh, when to use video, how to use it, what it's good for. Um, some of its functions are <coughs> the same as the functions of kind of visual PowerPoint slide view using images um, in PowerPoint which is that it can help people remember a particular point, um, especially if the video is you know, very funny or very moving or whatever. Um, and then also, um, it, it can serve analytic functions, right? So um, you can use video to make a point, um, although that's a lot harder. I mean, I think that's kind of, in some ways, the, the goal, that's the holy grail of using video. Uh, but sometimes it's not possible. Um, it's just sometimes, kind of fun to, to see how people in the real world talk about ideas that you're discussing. So this, for example, this is a video of uh, Judge Rampolitano. You guys don't know who he is. He's, he's a Fox News personality and uh, talking about, I don't think I'm going to play this, but um, talking about the right to bear arms in a, in a uh, Chicago case, actually. Um, and it's just fun to hear him talk and hear him analyze the very same issue that we're discussing, especially if it's something that's current. You know, if it's a current topic that can bring interest um, to things. But another way to use video is 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 emotional. Um, again, like like an image, a video can kind of resonate with people's emotions in a way that um, that words can't. And you just can't bring people into the classroom using words or even still images the way you can with a video. So, for example, I'm going to play this whole clip, but this is a this is a video of E. Windsor, who is the plaintiff in the Windsor case uh, that went to the Supreme Court this, this year, um, the case that struck down the Defense of Marriage Act. Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act is unconstitutional. Um, and the clip shows, it just shows her, it's, it's her story. Um, and, you know, I think some people who see this thing uh, will never forget it. I didn't know anybody in a particular neighborhood. 
suggest improvements, right? Like, so how would you do it? Um, and then you can, it's very hard to do this because it just takes, you really have to swallow hard before you elicit feedback from students I found. Anyway, they don't understand that anymore. Um, it's not easy. Um, but then when you read through them, you can look for patterns, right? And if, if it's the case that you know, a particular sentiment is shared by a wide percentage of the class, um, a portion of the class, then you, know, you want to address it. And it's good for you, it's good for the students. It, and then um, what I would do, and I think this is really important, is the very next class after you listen to this, you should tell them what they said. Um, and this should all be anonymous, but just tell them what the patterns were and what you're going to do to respond to them, the, that comment, those, that, those comments, right, those suggestions. And then it gives them, it tells them that you really care about them and what they're experiencing. And, and it gives them a sense of, you know, accountability and responsiveness that's powerful in building trust. Um, so I really, really, really strongly recommend it. I think it, it's very, very helpful. That's all I have unless you have other questions. We have to say something about website stuff? Oh, um, yeah. What's, so I, I, we touched on this before, but um, I do use a website um, for the course, and I think it's it's a, you can kind of make more or less of it depending on your proclivities. I do, I always use it to post course materials, as I mentioned. Um, and I offer a discussion group um, that students are decide to take advantage of or don't. I also post the syllabus there, and I tell them that the official version of the syllabus will be the one that's posted on the website, subject to change. I'll tell them when I change it in class, but you know, if you need to look at the syllabus, go there. Uh, and those are the main ways. You, you can also, Many of them have calendar functions, which I don't find helpful, or polling functions, which you can sometimes use. Um, but those are the main ways in which I use it. Anything else? Yeah. 
have you ever changed your syllabus like during the course after your feedback like your the, the feedback you have done during the course? Yes. Um, so this syllabus is an example of that. So you know, it's, it, the questions only begin on you know, the third to last page because someone said in the midterm evaluations, "Hey, it would be really good to have questions." Um, I, that was not a trend, right? That was not a, that was not a something that a lot of people said. One person said it, and I thought, oh, I really agree with that," um, and so I started. Um, but yes, and then also you can change not only the format of the syllabus but the content. You know, if people really want a certain subject matter and you're not planning on covering it, if you're open to covering it, you can change it in response to feedback. You don't have to agree with everything students say. You don't have to do everything that they say. I mean, you should keep you know your wits about you and read these comments. But um, but uh, but where you agree, you know, can be very helpful. You can, you can, you can just be really helpful. Yeah. Um, well, we already talked about this a little bit before, but um, law students, what are they like? <laughs> to undergrads, to you know, grad students. <laughs> well, you know, here it's, it, this is a little hard for me because I don't have much of a comparative perspective. You know, I, I only know what they're like. <laughs> so, I mean, except for this conversation, um, I haven't had that much experience with other types of students. But I mean, they're very hardworking and smart, and um, I think politically a little bit more. Uh, diverse than um, in other parts of the university. That's my experience. I mean, they're real conservatives in multiple ways, uh, and that's not always true elsewhere. And it's a good thing. Um, bottom line oriented, especially these days, which I think is fine. In the what sense? You know, they're interested in pragmatic takeaways. Right, so they want to know the law and what's you know what they're going to need to know the lawyers. That's really what do my clients get away with? Well, <laughs> more like what's going to be on the exam and the bar exam. <laughs> they're very sort of oriented towards those things, um, but they're also like you know, you know they're in law school for a reason. They care about justice as you know as a general matter, and um, and they're open to ideas as long as you can satisfy them on the you know, basics. What they view is kind of I just noticed that on the syllabus you put your mobile phone number. Yes. Um, do you have any issues with that? No. No. Do they call you often? I knew it was a while ago. All right. And and what about do you uh, take friend requests on Facebook huh. for your students? Good question. That's something that's happening more and more. Yes, I do not. Yeah. I do not. I have a rule against it. Um, I also am like not much of a Facebooker, so although I do have a presence there, mm -hmm. but um, no. So I, um, I suppose in theory, if a student were to graduate and then want to be friends, you know, maybe it, that would be a different story because some students have become you know, real friends. Um, but I, I don't love the idea of friending them while they're students. I don't know why. I mean, I treat my Facebook page as completely public anyway, so maybe I should rethink that. Did you have another question? No, I was just going to say, I, I used to put my mobile phone on the syllabus, and this was the first year I finally had a student call me practically every day. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I'll never do this again. You're not going to do this So just be aware. You know, I, they, they don't take advantage of all the interactions many ways it's a matter of regret, especially um, practicing um, exam taking. I, I'm a, I strongly believe that they should practice that before they have to take an exam, mm -hmm. um, and they don't do it. It's extremely resource intensive on me. Like It takes a huge amount of time to look at practice exams, um, but I do it because I really believe that they ought to be doing this, and, and they, they typically don't. Most stuff they don't take advantage of, office hours, do you have strategies to encourage them to do? Like I, I, I'm someone that's terrible with that. Like I never get off stats. I've always been like really bad <laughs> in my career. And like I, but I, I mean, yeah. So I wonder, like, do you have things that you do in class to be like encourage them to come to software? Do you do stuff like mandate it once so that it'll leave it open? I know. I guess that's more of an undergraduate thing where they don't even know that they like. You know, like when you're a freshman, you don't even think you can. 
can go to office hours, like, I don't even know what that means. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, again, I don't have office hours, but you know, right, no, they come I don't have office hours in my office. No, yeah. I've never done that. Um, some years I've, I've had like a lunch program where I'll go to lunch with small groups over the course of the term. And I don't, even, I don't really know whether that's meaningful to them or whether they appreciate it. I have, it, it you know, I stopped doing it and I haven't seen any blowback. Uh, maybe I should encourage them to, you know, sort of, this is like a little more paternalistic, but this is good for you. <laughs> you know, and I'm going to encourage you to do it. Yeah, like something like the practice exams you're talking about, you think that they're very important, but like people don't take advantage. It's like, well, how, you know, yeah. It's a, it's yeah, a you know, what I do do is I go through problems like, um, uh, this one in class, right? And, and I tell them um, the, the exam prop, the exam questions will be like this. Like, this is this supposed to be like an exam question, so they get practice in class. So in that way, I force them, um, and they like that. Uh, but I, I haven't forced them to take practice exams. I mean, partly because I, it would, you know, honestly, it would overwhelm me. So you hand grade 100 exams. At yes. The end of the term. Yes. It takes two full weeks of work. So eight, you know, all day every day or two full weeks. Mm -hmm. At least maybe more. It's a lot. It's a big difference between law schools and, and other parts of the academy. I don't really know why we do it the way we do, but we don't have to use that. And so you have, and you're writing comments on the on the paper. Um, or you're just not typically. Um, I have a grading sheet. So the law school exams are though it's a own kind of animal, so I don't know how, how um, transferable this is, but um, they're typically fact patterns like this one. Um, and you know, at the end, you just ask, like, you know, was this constitutional? Um, and then I'll have a grading sheet that um, lays out all the issues uh, and apportions relative you know, kind of points to each issue and sub-issue, just as a way of keeping myself Honest, so I know that I'm grading consistently from student to student, um, and and then I'll, on the exam itself, I'll you know maybe make small marks or ask questions, but not a lot of notation on the grading sheet. I try to keep very careful track of what they've said and how well they've said it, and then um, I feel like I have a template for comparing them to other students because because it's graded uh, on a curve, all that matters is how they do relative to other students. Yeah. Now, do they pick them up? You? They can and they don't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah with with small numbers of exceptions, yeah. um, they can come. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't actually let them pick it up and take it away. I talk to each student who wants to review their exam. Um, but but not a lot of people do. Anything else? As you all are preparing your classes or going through all this yourself. Um, Feel free to email me or call me, and I'd be happy to talk further about teaching. I'm, I'm, I'm always looking for people. To talk to. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I love, I love you. Uh, and all my all my contact information is available on the syllabus, but also on the web, and so easy to reach. We'll be calling you while you're on your way to the airport. <laughs> this was really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School. Thank you.